and welcome to the Additive Manufacturing for Aerospace webinar. Um, we're going to get started and uh, just before I introduce our, our keynote speaker, uh, I just wanted to go through a, a couple of the logistics. Um, everybody is on uh, mute out there and uh, that's just to kind of keep the noise down. If you do have some questions or some comments you'd like to make, we will be monitoring the, uh, the questions window and the chat window as well. So if you have a question you'd like to uh, put in there, um, go ahead and type it in and we'll take some time at the end of the webinar today to do our best to answer everybody's questions. Uh, we're also going to try and launch a few polls through the uh, webinar today, not too many, I think just uh, a couple. Um, so we'll, we'll try and keep it light there. Um, but without uh, any further ado, uh, I'm John. I am the director, uh, one of the two directors of additive manufacturing here at Javelin Technologies. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Scott, who is our keynote speaker today, and is going to sh share a wealth of information in the uh, uses of additive manufacturing for aerospace folks. Hey, Scott, uh, I'll flip the screen over to you and then uh, take it away. All right, are you guys able to see the slide I have? Or John, can you see that? Scott, I can see your, uh, see your slide perfect. You're looking good. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Sachek, as John, as John said. I am uh, the leader for aerospace and defense business development for Stratasys. I work in what's called our vertical business unit, uh, which is a group that was founded about a year and a half ago as we started thinking more deeply about um, the transition that was happening from rapid prototyping into manufacturing. And what we realized at, at that juncture was that uh, the way we uh, approach uh, the markets is different. In rapid prototyping, you build a solid rapid prototyping system and uh, that same system can be used across uh, a number of industries because the application is the same, the, the prototyping is the same. But when it comes to manufacturing, how you manufacture a part for automotive versus how you manufacture a part for aerospace or a medical device, all of these have their own uh, intricacies in different subtleties. So um, the realization there was we needed to look outside and bring in people who understood those industries because they had lived and worked those industries and really start to internalize that sort of experience. Um, that's how I joined Stratasys, my background. Uh, is in aerospace engineering, uh, bachelor's and master's degree uh, in aerospace engineering. I uh, started my career with Lockheed Martin, uh, working primarily on the defense side uh, and primarily on, uh, on the missile and spacecraft side. And over the course of my career, I had transitioned into more uh, aircraft roles and then ultimately from the defense side at Lockheed Martin to uh, the commercial side, uh, going to Goodrich, which later became uh, United Technologies Aerospace Systems. And so my last role at Goodrich was leading program management for sensors and integrated systems that were going on commercial vehicles. So I spent a lot of time looking at uh, how you certify uh, electronic systems and, and, uh, and structural pieces for uh, in aircraft uh, under FAA regulations. So uh, getting a good understanding of that, which then uh, I was able to bring with me to Stratasys. So about a year and a half here at Stratasys, um, leading aerospace and business development, and it has been an incredibly uh, uh, fast-moving, uh, fast-paced, and, and interesting year and a half. And I'll share with you as we go through here some of the uh, the specific things that we've been able to to make public, and uh, the specific things that we've been able to really drive forward uh, within the industry. So I'm going to start with the assumption that uh, everyone on the call here has uh, a basic understanding of what 3D printing or additive manufacturing is. Uh, sometimes in a longer presentation I'll go through a couple of different types of, uh, of additive and, and what the various benefits of them may be relative to each other. Uh, but instead of that I'm going to dive right into the benefits of 3D printing on the whole for the aerospace industry. So to start with that, uh, design freedom. And design freedom is something that has always been there with 3D printing, but when you are prototyping something that is going to be manufactured a different way, uh, you have to kind of set that design freedom to the side a little bit. You've got to be able to uh, constrain your prototype to something that can be manufactured by another means. 
If, however, you break that assumption and you realize uh, there are materials here that can be taken to production, um, that design freedom becomes an asset to the part you're producing. You can start to create incredibly complex shapes uh, where you are taking uh, whole assemblies and consolidating them into a single part. Uh, you can start thinking about shapes differently. Uh, walls don't necessarily need to be a consistent thickness. Holes, if you're not drilling a hole, a hole doesn't necessarily need to be round. So teardrops and other shape holes have, uh, have become um, uh, more common within parts that are additively produced. And, and those holes don't need to go straight like a drill bit either. They can uh, have more of a torturous path uh, simply because that's what the designer is looking for or needs. But it's not only the fact that you can create a part that you couldn't create before, but also the fact that where and how you create that part can change as well. Um, by transforming the workflow, uh, you're able to look at things um, in a way that you weren't able to before this. So uh, a lot of times in my background in aerospace, you make a, a make-buy decision uh, early in the, the design cycle. You determine what it is that you're going to make and then you have to make a decision that lives for the life of the program whether it's something you're going to make or buy. Uh, when you have flexibility in your supply chain that additive can bring, um, that can change to a procurement by procurement basis. This time I need these parts very quickly. I'm going to, um, I'm going to print them in-house. Um, this time I have a little more time. I'm going to go outside to have them produced and so forth. And where aerospace really gets a lot of benefit from this is when you start to think about uh, long-term sustainment and the aftermarket. So uh, if you have certified printed parts, um, you can start looking at whether or not you need to stock parts long-term, whether or not you need a 30-year lifetime buy for a, from a supplier that's going out of business for an interior component that's going to break every uh, uh, once or twice every few hundred uh, uh, flights. Uh, you can now start thinking about do I stock just one or two of those and have the ability to replenish that stock on demand or do I just simply print on demand and, and uh, stock digitally. That same flexibility enables customization in a way that uh, it has always been possible but generally hasn't been cost effective. When you're tooling for a part uh, that tool gets paid for through amortizing the cost of that part uh, or that tool across uh, the lifetime uh, production of the parts. If you're not paying for tooling, which is the case in additive, if you're just producing that part, uh, building five slightly different parts costs exactly the same as building a, uh, uh, a single part that's exactly the same five times. Uh, what this has enabled is, um, for example, a business jet uh, provider that we've worked with looking at being able to fully tailor an interior. So uh, a lot of times there's stock options. You don't really want to move the height of the galley counter, for example, because that's going to have ripple effects through um, the structure, the bracketry, the, the ducting, the uh, uh, electrical lines, everything. There's going to be uh, significant ramifications for something as simple as moving a galley uh, table height. Uh, but if all of those parts are printed, or if you have the ability to print those parts, then that's no longer an issue. This aircraft just needs a slight modification, and you print the parts a, a slightly different way. Uh, it also opens up things like um, embedding a, a corporate customer logo into a panel, things like that, things where it would be very expensive to tool for, um, but you get the benefit of that differentiated experience. But now getting into more specifics. So aerospace applications. Uh, starting with Stratasys and, and our interaction with aerospace. Uh, this is by no means a linear timeline. You'll see uh, uh, 20 years pass in the first inch or so there. Stratasys was founded uh, as were a number of uh, elements that are now part of Stratasys, such as solid concepts and econolists. Um, all of those business units started between in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and throughout that, Aerospace had become a strong early adopter of uh, prototyping with additive. Uh, but then we get into that 2007 time frame where we start moving into serial production. So reaching AS9100C certification at our part production uh, facilities and starting to print parts uh, for Part 23 and Part 25 aircraft. 
other engagements then followed. In 2011, what's now Stratus' strategic consulting was working with Boeing and Virgin Atlantic on projects. In about 2012, uh, the core Stratasys team uh, started our first deep engagement with an aerospace OEM in Europe. Two years after that, we were delivering a certified material to Airbus. Um, that was uh, one of our first material specifications that we wrote with the partner, and now there are uh, uh, there are eight com customers or companies that have uh, material specifications, which we deliver Ultim 9085 against. That specific Airbus example then led to um, Airbus taking a additive, uh, specifically FDM, Altum 9085 solution to the A350 type certification. And A350s were delivered with printed 9085 parts starting at the end of 2014. In 2015, uh, we were accelerating on that. We got to announce what was done with Airbus. We got to start talking publicly about um, the multi-year relationship with the United Launch Alliance because they were going public with the fact that they were now printing uh, flight hardware for rockets. Uh, and then I'll touch on this a little bit later, but we also, working with Aurora Flight Sciences, un unveiled a fully printed or near fully printed um, jet uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, which was uh, quite far beyond what uh, people believed uh, that could be done with additive at that time. So looking across uh, our customers, both on a part side and on a machine side, we know of a, a wide variety of applications on different types of vehicles. Uh, you'll see uh, with uh, some helicopters and UAVs, a lot of uh, those parts are with laser centering. Um, they were adopted uh, quite early before the, uh, the more advanced materials for FDM had been introduced. We're now seeing a lot of shift there as, as FDM's larger sizes and, and uh, uh, very highly performant materials uh, become uh, good options for replacing uh, laser sintering in some cases, but really more than that, expanding the, uh, the application space that's available. Uh, you can see across the large aircraft, uh, what we're talking about mostly uh, today is non-loaded uh, interior components, customized pieces, uh, low volume uh, sort of uh, equipment. Uh, that's, that's expanding quickly and we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, variation and a lot of uh, interesting ideas from our customers, uh, particularly ULA and other space customers are coming up with some very creative uses of the technology that, uh, that really we didn't see. Uh, the other thing I'll mention on this is there's a couple of little green lines here pointing to some metals applications. Um, there is a ton of interest in the aerospace industry in printed metal. Um, a lot of that is around the powder-based um, products that have been out there for a while. Uh, and now there is more interest in some of the wire-fed larger scale uh, processes for more structural parts. Uh, what we're seeing though is understanding um, the, the physics behind what's happening and being able to certify that. Uh, there's a lag. So FDM, um, laser centering for plastics have been around for quite some time and that's had the opportunity to mature and be accepted by industry. There's a lot of money and a lot of effort going into understanding what can be done with metals, uh, but truly it is lagging. There are only a handful of applications flying uh, for printed metal parts. That's going to increase. It's going to increase rapidly, um, but, uh, but right now uh, the thermoplastics uh, have a unique place. I think that also dovetails with the fact with uh, aerospace has spent the last 40 years taking as much metal out of an aircraft as possible and replacing it with composites. And I think they're going to continue to do so, where you can topology optimize and where you can take weight off by changing the structure of a metal part, um, that's a, a weight savings. But where you can take that part and, and go from a, uh, a printed metal to a printed, printed composite or a printed plastic, I think you're still going to see the trend continue in terms of uh, taking metal off of aircraft and, and pushing uh, the weight uh, lower and lower. Flight parts are phenomenal to talk about. They're exciting. Uh, it's great to see what we're doing. Uh, the reality of our customer base is the money they're saving is happening on the factory floor. So assembly and automation fixtures, uh, jigs, fixtures, inspection fixtures, uh, all kinds of stuff that um, is often a second thought and is often something that you don't want to spend a lot of money on and you don't want to change uh, and retool for a new uh, a fixture if you can avoid it. Uh, so it ends up being a really, really nice fit for additive because you can really embrace the continuous improvement Lean Six Sigma sort of mindset when you have the ability to look at your process 
and I identify how to make a tool just ideal for that process. And then if it's not quite right, just change the tool and continue that process of, of continuous improvement. Uh, so jigs and fixtures are a huge uh, opportunity and a huge area of adoption, uh, but it's not the only part of the tooling space that, uh, that's being impacted. Uh, metal forming, for example. This one surprises people a lot of times that, oh, you're bending metal over plastic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the compressive strength of plastics like polycarbonate and uh, the Ultim 9085 and Ultim 1010 uh, are ideal for uh, metal bending applications and you get the added benefit of really self-lubrication that you're not bending metal over met metal and, uh, and uh, risking the, the fusing and, and interactions that that can uh, drive. Uh, it can be very durable parts, uh, lasting uh, hundreds and thousands of hits, uh, really. Uh, but even more interesting are the custom applications. The ability to create the exact part you need because you can create the exact tool you need to bend that part. Thermal forming, similarly, very interesting uh, because there are materials that are uh, uh, high temperature enough to withstand the process very effectively. And even more so, you can avoid vent holes and the kind of compromises that happen with thermoforming tools because with a printed part, you can control the porosity. We have complete control over the tool paths. So you want to draw vacuum straight through the part. You design the part to pull that vacuum straight through, and you can get an excellent drawdown uh, as a result without having to deal with uh, uh, any marking from vent holes. More specific example around inspection fixtures. Uh, this is uh, something that looks pretty basic. Doesn't look like there's a lot to it, um, but it does have a, a complex curve on that uh, that surface that's interfacing the uh, the product. Uh, producing these parts costs thirty thousand dollars in a forty day lead time. Being able to go to a printed tool uh, saves um, phenomenal amounts, both in terms of time and money. But what I think is even more interesting as part of this story is CPI was looking at ramping up and adding tools, uh, what they could do uh, because of the design freedom with uh, the printed tool, they were actually able to add additional measurements to the same inspection fixture. Um, so they were able to uh, produce a better product, a more thoroughly inspected product, uh, because they were able to uh, uh, take in a different approach uh, with tools and get the time and cost savings uh, in tandem. I touched on the metal forming. There's a specific example around that too. The Navy uses uh, polycarbonate uh, printed tools for custom repair. This example was a Harrier that uh, had a landing gear failure and they had the ability to land the Harrier on a table which saved the vehicle, saved the pilot, but uh, did cause some damage to a structural member in the front uh, of the nose. So they were able to very quickly print the pieces that they needed in order to, uh, to shape the L and Z uh, shape pieces that you see in the top right there and produce uh, what they needed to do to get a aircraft airworthy again within a week as opposed to having to look at uh, what normally would have been about a two month uh, time. And you think about the size of a uh, of an FDM, a printer, three feet by uh, two feet by three feet. It's pretty large, but uh, by no means this large. Uh, yet tools often are. Uh, this tool is printed. It's printed in a number of pieces and then joined together end to end to create this large piece. Uh, it is being held here by two guys, and one of them is smiling, so we know it's not that heavy. Uh, but what it replaced was an aluminum tool uh, that needed to be crane lifted. So uh, there's a significant reduction in uh, wor uh, workflow disruption with uh, the ability to have a much lighter tool uh, as well as lower risk. Uh, plus they could create a very complex geometry uh, for this, uh, <clears throat> use it effectively, and if they needed to change, if they needed to produce a slightly different tool, they would have the ability to go and do that uh, without the, uh, the expense of um, replacing this tooling in the traditional fashion. Composites is another space, um, both from the, the same idea as uh, metal forming in that you can create a very customized shape for a repair tool. 
uh, but more broad than that. Composite layup tools with Ultim 1010 can go into a 350 degree Fahrenheit cure cycle in autoclave uh, without deformation. It has a very high uh, heat deflection temperature and is able to withstand um, uh, those sort of environments. Uh, soluble materials uh, used for sacrificial or washout tooling, uh, creating those complex additive shapes for a mandrel uh, in order to hand lay up or, uh, or wire wand, uh, or filament wind uh, the part, uh, and then dissolve out that core and get an additive shape without seams uh, from a traditional composite. And then you look really across the process. You can look at net shape cores. You can look at layup tools, trim tools, all coming off of the same geometry in order to produce that part. Uh, one area we've done this is with a business jet uh, manufacturer who is looking at going from an aluminum aileron to a uh, uh, carbon fiber aileron. Uh, they came up with a rather complex tooling approach. Uh, didn't have a cost effective way to produce these tools uh, until we spoke with them about using Ultim 1010 in its capacity. And so you're seeing on the right side in the middle picture uh, those uh, yellowish brown parts. Those are all printed tools uh, that are used to form this uh, composite um, uh, aileron uh, with a drastic lead time reduction in order to support this, uh, this effort as well. Of course, uh, can't not talk about the Airbus story. So last year we were able to announce that uh, the A350 had type certified with printed parts uh, included as part of that certification. And the first several A350s were delivered with a number of printed parts. Uh, this was enabled by working for quite some time with Airbus to ensure that uh, we had a material specification agreed that we could deliver material certified against. That Airbus had a process specification that they could trust to repeatably produce parts. Um, and that really was opening the door here for Airbus to do this. Um, certainly this announcement really dates back to the end of 2014. I'm looking forward to opportunities to share more about where Airbus is going with this. And hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. Uh, but I think you can uh, very quickly just start thinking about uh, where this goes. If Airbus has um, the ability to include printed parts in their type certification, what's the impact on the A350's uh, aftermarket supply chain for this? There's, there's a lot of implications here, uh, and it's been a very exciting uh, uh, story to be involved in. Same with ULA. Um, there's a video link on the bottom of this if you want to scribble it down quick, or just on YouTube, uh, type Stratasys ULA. And there's a very interesting video on there where we have United Launch Alliance engineers talking about this duct that you see on the left side and, uh, and what that meant for them on this vehicle. So they're looking at an existing designed vehicle and having such a strong business case that it made sense to forego existing tooling, a sunk cost in qualification, and requalify and fly uh, printed parts because they were 60% um, cost reduction and you were taking 140 components into 16 and eliminating all of the labor and all of the risk associated with, uh, with building out um, the traditionally manufactured parts, all for an ECS system, just blowing cold nitrogen. Um, and, and it had a significant opportunity for them to uh, move from metal into plastic uh, in a much much more elegant fashion. There will be another video we uh, we share from ULA coming up in about a month here. It's in final review at ULA and that's going to be a, a really interesting one for a lot of people as well because it really talks about the whole picture. ULA started out with uh, uh, trade show models, printing trade show models, and then they went deep into tooling. There are 300 some tools that they use uh, for manufacturing a rocket today that are printed. And now it has shaped their thinking on flight parts for the existing family of rockets and even more so on the next generation uh, Vulcan launch vehicle. Uh, there will be a dramatic increase in the number of printed components on that vehicle. Similar to Airbus, this came about because we worked with them on developing material specifications and process specifications to enable them to have the confidence in uh, both the material and process that they needed to support an aerospace quality management system. One metal part I'll show is uh, this um, part from Herbal ATK. It's a titanium bracket. They were clearly designing for minimum weight. They took every last um, gram of titanium they could off of this part um, for that, uh, that weight savings. 
And as a result, you get to a very complex shape, which becomes more economic to build from the bottom up rather than to, uh, to hog out out of a piece of titanium. This sort of geometry, um, certainly in this example, it's, uh, it's a metal application where they benefit, but it's the same sort of mindset in the plastic applications as well. Where you can take weight out, uh, eventually you get to a complex structure that is more effectively uh, produced additively than subtractively. So we're going. A uh, couple of things here that have been new for us uh, really over the last couple of months, and this one being public just last week. So uh, we have a capability within Stratasys to uh, develop custom materials. It's our advanced material center um, that does this. And we've been working with them um, uh, internally uh, around customer needs. And one of them, stemming from the aerospace industry, was uh, we need a, a high temperature material that is also uh, electrostatically dissipative. Uh, hearing that question come again and again, we engage the Advanced Materials Center to uh, work a formulation to support this. Uh, NASA has parts going on the ISAT-2, or actually they're already on uh, the ISAT-2 uh, satellite, which will be launched, I believe, towards the end of this year, uh, that are produced with this material. Uh, it's a PEC uh, resin uh, that has carbon nanotube filler to support electrostatic dissipation. Uh, that's the same approach we take with our ABS ESD7, so a low temp electrostatic material. Um, but with the PEC resin, we're able to get Altum 9085 level strength and chemical resistance beyond anything that we've ever, uh, uh, ever offered um, before. So this is really a, a test material. This is something that we've seen interest from the aerospace industry in. We had aerospace partners um, engage in this, provide the requirements for this, and we now offer it as a special order to those customers um, that have, uh, have participated in the development as well as others that are interested. Uh, but not just this material. Uh, what we really want to highlight with this is the fact that we have the ability to meet customer requirements uh, for unique applications and we can do that through our advanced material center capability. So um, that's something that, uh, uh, that we hope to see more of going forward, more of these functional materials and highly application targeted materials that have a lot of benefit, but not necessarily uh, the widespread interest that uh, a traditional commercial material would. On um, last topic here is optimized tr structures. I just mentioned that little uh, blurb earlier on a printed UAV. Uh, this is another one that comes with a really good video. The uh, link is here. It's pretty easy to find through the Stratasys website too. Look for aerospace and then there's a UAV video here. Um, and it's interesting. It's, it's great to hear Aurora Flight Sciences talk about how we worked together in order to accomplish this. What they wanted to do was prove that you didn't need to produce a generic vehicle that could meet all mission requirements. It would be effective with additive to target a specific application set, or specific requirement set, and customize a vehicle to be ideal for that, uh, that specific mission. Um, and that's what we did. Aurora determined uh, against a requirement set what the uh, outer mold line should look like. We then topology optimized. Uh, the interior to produce a stiff, very lightweight vehicle uh, uh, that couldn't be produced, excuse me, couldn't be produced traditionally. It needed to be additively manufactured to get to the weight targets that we were looking at. So that flew in uh, September of this last year, and that background picture is, uh, is the vehicle itself in flight. What this vehicle looks like internally, though, is, is rather interesting. It's very modular. It's uh, uh, fairly simple. Uh, not a lot of different parts. Uh, the bulk of the vehicle was produced uh, with fused deposition modeling, so the body of the vehicle is ASA, as were the wings. Uh, we uh, uh, used Ultim 9085 for a couple of parts that needed to carry a little bit more weight in the, uh, uh, in the landing gear area. Uh, then we used Ultim 1010 for a hot section uh, on an exhaust cowling, uh, which actually covered a printed Inconel 718 uh, thrust vectoring exhaust nozzle which sat inside a uh, uh, laser-centered nylon-12 conformal fuel tank uh, just behind the, uh, uh, the turbojet engine. So you look at this vehicle and uh, flies 150 miles an hour. Theoretically, it could go about 215, uh, but uh, we don't want to push that. Uh, so we've, uh, we've limited ourselves there to something that's, that's more than fast enough. Uh, and what's interesting for me here, though, is that we have a 30-pound UAV uh, it's three meters in wingspan, nine feet across, 
and 24 pounds of those 30 are all printed. The, the remaining six pounds are that turbojet engine in the center, as well as uh, the wiring uh, battery uh, servos and, uh, and the landing gear. What this means, though, and this is what AFS, Aurora Flight Sciences, talks about in the video, and that's, that's a quote from an individual there, oh, this is going to flip on me, is that um, uh, they were able to cut the design and build time of the aircraft by 50%. So you look at a traditional manufacturing program and you're looking at tooling and procurement, sub-assembly and final assembly, and you're not going into even tooling and procuring parts until you're confident that you're going to get it right because if you get it wrong, you're going to be modifying or replacing that tooling and that's, that's a waste of money. What we were able to do with this is move very, very quickly from uh, design to print because if we got it wrong, we just printed again. We didn't have that cost of tooling engaged. So our longest lead time on, uh, on any of the major components in the vehicle was nine days. And that's not nine days of labor, that's nine days of a printer running to produce that large fuselage that's essentially the full volume of a Fortis 900. The, Steve, are you still there? If you can hear us, we've lost we've lost your audio. Steve, uh, if anyone out there can hear me, maybe just let me know, um, and we'll wrap this up. Okay, yep. Somebody says yes. Maybe they can hear me. Okay, so it's John here from uh, from Javelin again. I guess we lost Steve right at the end. That's too bad. I think he was just about to wrap up, and he's sharing some of his contact information there. Maybe he'll uh, he'll, he'll join back in. Um, why don't we go ahead? There's a few questions at the uh, at the end of the uh, the presentation. Uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions without Steve. Um, I may be able to come from the aerospace industry myself, so I might be able to uh, answer a few of those. And then we do have a few. Uh, polls we'd like to run. So maybe we can get some of the polls going while Steve tries to get back in. Um, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind just running one of those. One of the polls is, uh, you know, if you're brand new to 3D printing, we have an introductory hands-on course. Um, if you think you might be interested in coming in and trying to understand what 3D printing is all about, spend some time hey, John, uh, looking at parts to understand what yeah. Oh, there's Steve. Perfect. Um, Steve, just running some, some polls and then we've got some questions for, uh, for you as we get going here. Sure. Um, how far back? How where was I at when I dropped off? You were just you had just flipped over. We're just about to flip over to your contact info. So I think we get we get most of it there. Um, so we're just running a couple of quick polls. If people could go ahead and fill out the poll question on um, on the training course, if you're interested in just a one day introductory course that'll help you understand what can and can't be done with the printers. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, Aaron close that out whenever you think uh, we're. We've got um, most people there, and then I think we've got one uh, one more poll that we'll run, and then we'll flip over to the questions. Just help us get an understanding if you've got some interest in the different a uh, applications, which applications are uh, are of interest to you. So we'll let you fill that one out, and then um, Steve, maybe uh, I don't know if you could see the questions there, but I'll, I'll run through them. So one of the questions is, you know, what different materials can you print with? Uh, sure. So the um, actually, you know what? I uh, oh, I'm not sharing anymore. Okay. Um, the the variety of materials for FDM is pretty broad. Uh, what I see most used in the aerospace industry uh, really is the Ultim 9085. Uh, it's a polyether emid material. It was custom blended for flame, smoke, and toxicity properties by GE a number of years ago, and that that's now uh, a formulation owned by Sabic. Uh, Ultim 1010 is a pure polyether emid. Uh, also meets uh, flame smoke tox properties under most conditions. Also has some added benefits around being uh, um, biocompatible and, and food safe. Uh, we also see with um, 
uh, with some of the applications where uh, the heat deflection temperature doesn't need to be as high. Uh, we see use of um, uh, FDM uh, nylon 12, um, then um, uh, PC polycarbonate and an ASA material as well as an ABS. Uh, generally not flying for those materials because of the, uh, the inability to meet a flame smoke and tox uh, requirement, but very common for our tooling applications are ASA, ABS, and polycarbonate. Great. Here, here's another one, um, and just knowing maybe a little bit about the companies that are, that are on the call here, the same person asked a question about the accuracy and tolerances that we can hold, and uh, you know I think there's a general answer maybe you could give us, and then maybe you could also answer the question from a composites perspective relative to the different materials that we could print with that might be um, appropriate to, uh, to print form layups. Sure. Uh, well, I'll take the composites one first. That's something that uh, uh, we have an engineer working feverishly right now to finish up a composite tooling design guide. Uh, with Ultim 1010, uh, that material and its ability to, uh, to endure uh, the common temperature cycles for, for a high temp layup uh, really has seen a lot of interest in that space. Uh, working with uh, Abris to include it in their training curriculum, uh, working with a num number of uh, aerospace customers who want to use that or are already using that uh, now. And so we're putting together a design guide which, which should be available uh, in quarter two here uh, to really walk through that process and the considerations that need to be made. Uh, Ultim 1010 certainly doesn't have um, the coefficient of thermal expansion of, of even aluminum. It is a uh, uh, it has a higher CT. There is a little bit uh, more that needs to be considered in terms of deformation as a result for a very long period cure. Um, uh, but really, there's a, a number of applications where that is a really good fit. Uh, lower temp, uh, we've seen Ultim 9085 used um, in in some uh, some lower temp cure applications. Um, I think that's about the lowest that uh, that we've seen much significant use. Um, and then of course there's the fat sacrificial uh, uh, tooling, which is something that we're expanding on this year as well. So in the past, uh, people have used our soluble support materials that are typically used to support ABS and ASA uh, in a build uh, and use those as the model material to produce something that they could dissolve away. Uh, that works, but it's kind of an off-label use of the machine really traditionally. So what we've done is taken that same material and uh, tuned uh, a software settings for the machine so that we could uh, really control better the, the geometric, geometric um, uh, accuracy of that part uh, as a model part and not really as just a, a support material sort of approach. Uh, so that's something that we've also got targeted for some more information release mid-year uh, and there's there's some, some advanced information that we'd be able to, to get you so that as it's coming out you guys can be aware and, and able to pick that up uh, quickly. Um, so around composite usage, usage uh, really Ultim 1010 and then the sacrificial cores are, are really key. Um, and then the other question was around uh, accuracy and tolerances. So that is something that, uh, that has room to improve in future systems. I think you'll see a lot of focus on that. Uh, with composite tooling specifically there, uh, we, we take a little less concern because ultimately you're going to be secondarily finishing those those surfaces uh, to the surface you need for for composites that's not going to come out of the machine that way uh, but in most cases or in a lot of cases uh, the accuracies are are pretty sufficient I actually don't have the numbers in front of me and I apologize for that uh, but uh, the uh, uh, five thousandths of an inch range is uh, is what's frequently considered there. Uh, that doesn't stop you from targeting uh, much more uh, tight uh, uh, accuracies with the part or tolerances with the part, um, but you may uh, engage some secondary processing in order to do that really effectively. Uh, we can get awfully close, um, but uh, uh, to some two thousandths tolerances depending on the geometry, um, but it likely makes sense to, uh, to plan on some secondary processing on key surfaces. So it's another question: Would the um, you know the new test material, the PEC material, would it would it have any applications for composite tooling, or is it is it uh, really just for the ESD applications? 
I don't think you would uh, uh, you would find a, a effective business case using PEC for composite tooling. Uh, that base resin is is quite expensive. So, uh, and the carbon nanotube fill is is pretty minimal uh, to get to just into that uh, dissipative range. Uh, so it's not giving you the the full uh, CTE matching benefit that you would think if you were using like a short fiber filled uh, plastic. Uh, I'll tell you that's that's not out of the range of possibility, and uh, we've we've certainly done some development work uh, in that space. Uh, so if you're looking for a carbon filled material appropriate for more CTE matched uh, composite tooling, uh, that's something that we can talk about, and then we can potentially engage a, a custom material development um, around that topic. Great. Last uh, last question, and uh, I think we're getting uh, technical on this one, but let's see what we can do. <laughs> um, how do you deal with the fatigue properties or a DTA analysis? Are there any SN curves of uh, you know, conventionally manufactured metals versus 3D printed? So that is something that uh, we do have some background work going uh, this year that's going to be pretty substantial uh, around Ultim 9085 and Ultim 1010 since those are both materials that are of a lot of interest to, uh, to uh, in-flight use, to airworthy part use. Uh, there's a lot of data that, that really is needed uh, to take those fully through the certification process, especially up till now a lot of the parts have been non-loaded. The materials are strong though. so. Uh, when you start looking at structural applications, all of those questions get very interesting for uh, Transport Canada or the FAA or whoever you're working with. Um, so up till now, primarily that sort of testing has been done by our customers and then they hold that data proprietary because it's the result of their investment. Uh, we do have two projects underway this year that hopefully by the end of the year or the very uh, beginning of next year we'll be able to make uh, uh, really B-basis allowable level data uh, public. Uh, for 9085 and for 1010, um, with uh, with the ability to address a lot of those questions in a in a more concrete and publicly releasable sort of way. Great. Um, someone snuck in one more question while we were uh, finishing up here. Um, it's a good a good question too. Uh, it's a little bit more about the naval environment, perhaps for seaplanes, and they're wondering about the the resistance of the plastics to seawater. Um, so Ultim 1010 and Ultim 9085 um, do well in those regards. Uh, we haven't done full uh, mill standard 810 testing uh, on those. Uh, it's being discussed. It's just a question of uh, if we've got people interested in the application. Uh, but certainly we've done the fungus testing and we know that, uh, that uh, the parts are good there. Uh, the polyether imids are, are very resistant materials. So. Um, the salt water uh, generally wouldn't be an issue. Um, salt fog environment, all of those things should be uh, uh, good with a PEI. And there is likely data available uh, from SABIC or from others who have used those materials in injection molding um, capacities uh, that may be published now. The, what we use is the same uh, material, the same raw uh, resin that's, uh, that's used for injection molding. And all we do is filamentize it. So we put it into a filament so that we can then print with it. It uh, doesn't change the properties of the material. So data that you can find around PEI uh, is applicable to, to print at Ultim 9085. Great. Hey, Steve, thanks so much. It's been, uh, it's been a great amount of information. Uh, hopefully it's, been, uh, it's answered everybody's questions. We have one last poll that we're going to run and then a bit of a wrap-up slide. We're just about on 45 minutes where we want it to be. Maybe, uh, Aaron, you could run that last poll, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Everybody could go ahead and answer the poll. When we've got uh, close to quorum, Aaron will go ahead and close that, and then we'll just wrap up on uh, some next steps if people are interested. Perfect. Um, I know that Steve had um, his contact info up there, but uh, if it's a little more convenient for you, uh, my contact info as well. We'll be reaching back out to everybody on the webinar just to uh, to make sure that we're we're touching base and that it, it met everybody's expectations. 
If you want to learn some more, uh, there are more. There is more information. So we, we have material data sheets, and I think Steve made mention of some other manuals that will be available. If you'd like to have some eViz access to those types of things, let us know. If you'd like to have just an introductory phone call, or if it makes sense, you know, we even have um, Steve come in for a bit of an on-site applications assessment. Those are all sorts of things that we'd be uh, happy to to organize on uh, on your behalf. And with that, uh, I'm going to say thanks to everybody out there for joining us. Um, I hope the information was good, and enjoy the rest of your day.